They march in the Columbus Day and St. Patrick Day parades each year, rain or shine. They are the only elementary school marching band in the Archdiocese of Philadelphia. Stay tuned and find out who the boys and girls in the band are on school days. Then hear three women's personal stories about how they answered their call to religious life. Next on Catholic Magazine. With your window on your world, this is Catholic Magazine. Hello again, everyone. I'm Paul Pirello. And I'm Pat Shelton, and we're happy and thankful that you decided to join us again this week. Later on tonight's program, we'll meet a Catholic author of children's books whose stories contain themes of self-acceptance, caring for the environment, and getting involved in your community. We'll also hear the stories of three women and find out how today's women religious are called to be a part of society, not apart from it. But first, we travel to South Philadelphia where they're striking up the band at St. Monica's Elementary School, where the school marching band is the pride of their pastor, Bishop Louis D. Simone. Here is School Days. It's a great pleasure to be on Catholic Magazine and to be part of this segment, School Days. Welcome, boys and girls. This is a very happy group of boys and girls you see behind me. They are the boys and girls of St. Monica School, where I, Bishop De Simone, am so honored to be pastor. And these boys and girls are good boys and girls. They study hard, they work hard, but they have something special about them, and that is that they have a musical ability. I hope you have one, too. Study music, study an instrument, and God bless you for that. Hi kids, my name is Paul, and this is St. Monica Marching Band and Pom Pom Girls in South Philadelphia. I'm the leader of the drums. I think they're fun and enjoyable. <laughs> Hi kids, my name's Laura and I'm one of the leaders of the flute section. I've been in St. Monica Band for three years and have competed in three Immaculata Band Festivals. I can say for the rest of the band that that makes us very proud. If you want to, take the if you want to start playing the flute, it takes a lot of hard work and determination in the beginning, but your work certainly pays off. Hi, I'm Joe. And I'm Joe. No, I'm Joe. Well, anyway, we're the section leaders for the saxophone. Saxophone is a cool instrument, and it's fun to play. And it's heavy. My father plays the saxophone, and he, he kind of got me into playing it. And I just thought it was really cool. I'm better than him. <laughs> Girls. Being a pom pom girl means showing school spirit, practicing a lot, very hard work, representing our school, exciting and fun, long, hard hours, and a lot of patience. We got the spirit, yes, we do. We got the spirit, how about you? Sure. Hi, kids. My name's Mike, and Mike knows music. 
I've been in a band for three years and seven parades, and I'll be back for the next one. Hi, kids. I'm Louis Boyukas. I bet you can't say that three times real fast. Well, being in a band also means winning lots of great awards and bringing great honor to your school. So if you want to play an instrument, just do it. The students who are in St. Monica's band give up two hours each week after school for practice. God bless them. Stay tuned. We'll be right back after these messages. <laughs> So, Casanova, do you know what time it is? Sometimes the best friend is an old friend. Hi, Mrs. Christo. These are for you. Beautiful. Make an old friend. Three minutes, an American child dies because of poverty. Children make up 27% of the general population, but they account for 40% of the people living in poverty. As the numbers indicate, the situation has reached a crisis level. Johnson, you seem to have a clear picture of the problem. What's your assessment? I'm more than a number, I'm a person. If you don't take care of me today, how do you expect me to take care of this country tomorrow? Welcome back to Catholic Magazine. Up next, we meet Lorene Leedy, who is an author and illustrator of almost 20 children's books. A convert to Catholicism, Lorene believes that her faith inspires her writing. Uh, children tickle me because they are so different. <laughs> Each one is so different, even at the youngest, the youngest kids are, are very distinct personalities and they have their own way of looking at the world and reacting to things. I have a lot of fun with them. I went to a birthday party yesterday with a little four-year-old girl that lives next door and I just had the greatest time hanging out with four-year-olds. <laughs> Hanging out with children is not just a pastime for Laureen Leedy. As a children's author and illustrator, she says it's important to understand what children need and feel. I don't think anybody pays attention to what children are thinking. We just think about how we're going to educate them and how we're going to um, impose our standards on, or not impose our standards, but we're, we're going to tell them how it is. This is how it is. And, and we forget that they have ideas of their own. It's those ideas that Lorene hopes to encourage through books that challenge children in creative ways. Well, I'd like for them to learn something and to have fun learning it, not, maybe not even know they're learning it, <laughs> and uh, for them to be exposed to things that maybe they haven't seen before, ideas about being creative or um, I have a book about writing a newspaper and that they can uh, read it and then go make a newspaper themselves for their, news, uh, for their neighborhood or their school or their family. So I always like to get the kids um, involved in something beyond just reading the book. With a college degree in fine arts, Lorene had tried various ways to apply her artistic talent. She was selling miniatures and jewelry when a children's author noticed her work and encouraged her. Once I saw what somebody could do in this field uh, to be an illustrator and a writer of children's books, I thought, hey, that's for me. I really, it, it was just one of those things where I knew that was something I wanted to do. And, and seeing somebody in real life made it seem possible. If he could do it, I could do it. Now, that's a little naive, <laughs> but it worked out. And he was very encouraging. Even though now she has 14 books to her credit, 
Loreen says the beginning was full of rewrites. First two or three were really awful. You know, I, I worked for a week on something and then this is really terrible and threw it out and had to start over. But that didn't last long. The books that emerged wove together themes of caring for self, others, and the environment. She creates wacky characters that children love. My characters are very lively and they're usually very colorful and they have a lot of expression on their faces. Sometimes they get so enthusiastic their eyebrows lift right off their head. They're very animated and, and lifelike and very warm towards each other and I, I, I like to show the different kinds of relationships that is, are possible. Of course the animals are substitutes for humans. Sometimes they get angry and sometimes they um, maybe get sad, but most of the time I have them in more positive kinds of situations in, in the end. And that's the other thing I like about this field is that it's a very upbeat and an optimistic viewpoint on life. And that's where I want to be. That's what I want to be involved in. I, all I know is I get an idea about something that I think would be something that children need to know about. For example, um, the environmental book, The Great Trash Bash. OK, how many times do you think about trash? Never, probably. And, and as a child, I never thought about trash. What's trash, you know? I just didn't care about it. But when, when you uh, see it in a book, then it, it, it becomes part of your awareness. About the same time her career was becoming successful, Lorene became aware of a strong personal faith and felt drawn to the Catholic Church. She says exploring nature and new settings inspires both her creativity and her personal faith. My faith is very um, unexpected in a way. It can't be, my faith life can't be separated from the rest of my life. It's all one life. <laughs> and um, I just try, whatever it is I'm working on at the time in terms of faith, it seems to find its way into my artwork and my, and my writing. I'm lonely. Son, we love you just the way you are, Papa said. Georgia Langdon is religious education director at St. Margaret Mary Church in Winter Park, Florida. She used Lorene's story, Pingo the Plaid Panda, before it was even published. I needed a book for Kid Fest. It's our summer program where the kids come every day for two weeks. And I wanted some story that really helped them know that no matter who they were, no matter what their differences were, they were fine. And Pingo was just a perfect story. They all played ball, thump, thump. Jump. jump. They danced in circles, jump, thump. jump. Jump. And they turned somersaults, bump, thump. bump. Good. We did it for uh, the pancake breakfast one morning. We acted it out, and so the parents were there, too. And I think it really, uh, it helped the parents kind of know how to respond to their kids when they came home with a difference in themselves, like nobody will play with me because whatever. So it gave them some ideas. Georgia says that although Lorene's books are not overtly religious, they do nurture the child's spirit. Well, for Pingo, I think that, that uh, God makes good stuff. You know, he makes, uh, he makes things the way they should be. And Pingo was perfect plaid. And I think kids learn from that that they're perfect the way they are, and it'll just build their self-esteem. I mean, religion, that's where it starts. It's been a strong start for Lorene, but she says she's just begun developing her stories. She does have one definite goal. <laughs> for me are my books. Well, actually, it's, they're sort of interchangeable. I, you know, I feel very connected with, it's like me and my books. Yeah, it's the same thing. Um, I would like to be very successful. I mean, I've been successful, but I want to be very successful and sell a lot of books. <laughs> Along with reading and having fun, the children are being taught strong values at a very early and impressionable age. We'll be right back.
Three years ago, I made a film in a severely depressed section of Trenton on behalf of Martin House. I pleaded for volunteers and support to assist poor families in need of help with nowhere else to turn. This morning I went back and I saw a changing community, from neglect and desperation to vitality and renewed hope. Yes, we're making progress thanks to Martin House and you, but please don't stop now. Call Martin House at area code 609-989-8143 and see how you can continue to help. Thank you. Pope John Paul II is expected to make Blessed Catherine Drexel of Philadelphia a saint of the Catholic Church. Blessed Catherine was an educator and a pioneer of racial justice in the early 20th century. You're invited to pray at the Blessed Catherine Drexel Shrine in Ben Salem, Pennsylvania from 1 to 5 p.m. every day. The shrine is located on Route 13, Bristol Pike, off the Woodhaven Road exit of I-95. For more information, call 244-9900. The role of religious women in modern society is not quite what it was like in the old days. Listen as three of today's women speak candidly about how they answered their call in our next segment entitled Answering the Call. Few of us are aware of the dedication needed to devote one's life to God. Three different women who are members of separate sisterhoods are bound together by religious vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. Delving into the lives of these women, we gain insight into their innermost thoughts. Each, each person has a unique calling. I, when I entered, I thought I did the choosing, but you learn that you don't choose. It's God that does the work. He, he's the one that chooses you. <laughs> I'm choosing to stay because I'm convinced that there is a reason and a purpose for religious life. Um, it, always, it hasn't always been an easy time. Um, Again, no life, no lifestyle is. It's not just all, you know, fun and games and bed of roses all the time. But there's something real definite that the community says to me. There's, there's nothing subtle about my relationship with God. It's very tangible, kind of if I've been brought up with God in the school of hard knocks. I can remember when I was in sixth grade, I wanted to be a leper nun until they found a cure for leprosy, and then I didn't want to be a nun anymore. And I had finished high school and was in nursing. I was a student nurse when I first started getting the kind of the inclination or the feeling that this was meant for me. Um, but I had other fish to fry at the time and I had a great social life and you know I liked to travel and I liked boys and uh, I liked the freedom and I liked the independence and, and I you know was a very into the social um, part of everything I think. And I I can remember even saying to myself that, you know, this gradual awareness became stronger and stronger, but not even being able to talk to anybody about it, and just saying to myself, you know, I can't do it because of this and this and this. And then one by one, those obstacles kept being removed from, from my making a decision. So I would say I was out of nursing, um, and once I made up my mind, I entered about four or five months later. Sister Sheila Marie Walsh, administrator of Buffalo's Mercy Hospital, belongs to a community of women founded in Ireland in 1831. The work of the Mercy Sisters varies. Their main mission is education and the delivery of health care. I think these can be really exciting times for women in the church. Um, I think people are becoming more aware of the qualities and the gifts of women in the church. I think we have a struggle yet because all the policies and the rules and regulations in the church have been formulated and promoted by men. And all the psychologists and the psychiatrists will tell you that women function very differently from men. Um, and they should complement each other. So it's very difficult to have the rules and regulations dealing with religious life being formulated by men who don't have the same emotionalism, who don't have the same psyche, who don't have the same um, values, so to speak, as women. So I think as we are able to bring women more and more into the policy making, the rules and regulations, how communities should be operating, um, the very culture, the women's culture, as that can be brought into um, a valued part of the church, I think that the role of women religious will blossom even more so than it already has. And I think that women will make an increasingly important contribution to the church. And I want to be there when that happens. 
gone are the days when the women are just, you know, pushed in the background. We have some very educated, religious women, very educated single women in the church. Um, but have degrees that are capable of doing a lot of things, a lot of ministerial things, um, a lot of administrative things that formerly were just done by priests, by men. And we've been, sisters have been trained, women have been trained, and they need to have the place and the time and the honor to do that. Sister Martha Proko is a St. Joseph sister and office manager of the youth department for the Diocese of Buffalo. The Sisters of St. Joseph, who are mainly a teaching order, moved to Buffalo and founded St. Mary's School for the Deaf. A lot of people entered when they were 17, 18 years old. And you, you change a whole lot from a 17-year-old to even a 24, 25-year-old. Um, so that's why we've encouraged people, young women, to wait a while to get some social background. You know, go out and date and have a job, have a car, go on vacations, do all that kind of thing to um, educate themselves. Again, the maturity level is very different between a 17, 18 year old and then, you know, even a 22 year old. So we figure that maybe if they get some of their growth experience out of their system or into their system, whatever way, that when they come to us, some of the rough parts might have been solved. I think it's good that people are older when they um, enter religious life, but it, it's also not without its problems. You know, if people are used to the independence and you have your own car and you've had your own job and you have your own money and you can, uh, it's, it's, they're probably giving up more because there are things that they've had versus the the young ladies that just came out of high school and entered without maybe never having a job, without having some of the experiences. I think you're giving up more and you have a, a better sense of what you are giving up and you're making a better choice. You're making a choice that this is what you really want is religious life. And you're making a choice out of experience and out of decision making, not because you never knew anything different. So I think it's healthy. I think it's better, but it's more difficult. I entered about a little over 30 years ago, and it was quite monastic. Uh, I loved it, but with, since Vatican II, there have been very, very good changes in, along the spiritual lines and our lifestyles, and it's, I think it's more challenging to each individual sister to live out her her spirituality and her own life and her community. I'm very, very happy to be living in that era. Founded in Philadelphia in 1861, the Franciscan Sisters under Bishop John Newman settled in the Buffalo area. Their ministry encompasses teaching, caring for the underprivileged and elderly. Franciscan Sister Ann Hoyer has recently taken on a new position as editorial assistant for the Western New York Catholic newspaper. When I entered, I, I, I wanted to give myself completely to God, and I thought this was the way to do it, and I just know in, within me that this is what God wants me to do, and I, I, that's what I'm here for. And I think that's probably the most rewarding. It's not what you do, it's what you become, and I hope to be, you know, a, a good, faithful, religious woman. So I don't think religious life will become extinct. I think it will change drastically. I think religious life 100 years from now is, is unrecognizable. A lot of people will say, do you think it's going to still be in existence? And oh, definitely. It may be on a different form of a different appearance in a few years. It may take on a different form of life, but it's always going to be religious life. It's, it's a gift. It's the gift of the Holy Spirit, and it's very important. It'll always be with us, I'm, I know. My mission is to be a good religious woman, also to, because I work in the youth department, to make young people comfortable with themselves and with their God, to be comfortable in a common, ordinary place, not to only find God in church, but to find God in themselves and each other in different circumstances, 
on retreats where it's a more informal kind of meeting their God instead of just, you know, a church setting. My mission is, is, is with our, my community is to live out the gospel message. And this was St. Francis's way of life and we are to continue with that. And I try to do that by my prayer life, my living in community, and my working for Western New York Catholic paper by printing the Word of God and bringing the good news to our people in the diocese. I would never be happy anyplace else, but this is really what, what God is asking of me. And I, I go back to my Irish superstition again, and I, I don't want to cross him anymore. And if this is what he wants of me, there's got to be a reason for it. And I, I, I've never had any doubts since I've entered that this is where I belong. Ah, uh, yes, things have really changed, Paul. Remember the days when sisters' habits were dusting the sidewalks mm -hmm. and uh, sisters didn't drive? And, well, it's just a whole new day today. Everything is changing out there today. Well, guess what? We're what? on the eve of two of the biggest holidays of the year. You know we what are. they are, don't you? Your birthday and my birthday. Yeah, November 22nd, and Paul's birthday. And you're November birthday. 24th. Yes, and you may send your cards and letters, care of Catholic Magazine. That's right. That's well, awful. Wouldn't hurt. And it was so nice of them here, too, to get the birthday cake. Oh, yeah, there, any, any minute now, they're going to mm -hmm. jump out with the cake. Uh, 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 we uh, we I wish. I they got it stuck back there in the closet. But, uh, no. And, of course, uh, coming up on Thursday is Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving Day, A time yes. for, uh, for everybody to sit and contemplate and to be thankful for, yes. for all, that, all that you have. Count your blessings. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, until next week, uh, that wraps up this edition of Catholic Magazine. I'm Paul Perello. He remembered, and I'm Pat Shelton. Have a wonderful Thanksgiving, and we'll see you next week. Good, Good night, night, everybody. Set materials for Catholic Magazine provided by Tag Lover Incorporated serving the Delaware Valley for over 75 years. And by John Wanamaker, fine stores in the Delaware Valley. We welcome your comments, suggestions, and donations and encourage you to write us at Catholic Magazine, St. Charles Seminary, 1000 East Wynwood Road, Overbrook, Pennsylvania, 19096, or call us during regular business hours at 668-9842.